Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today we're going to be talking about why Satan hates Mary so much. That's right. Satan is the father of lies and hatred, and he hates the whole human race. But of all of us, he hates Mary the most, and we're going to show you why. Hail Mary, full of grace, punch the devil in his face. Here we go. We're already off to a very contentious start. Uh, <laughs> There's no contention. Mary punched Satan in the face. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You know what I you know what I love the most is is, you know, all joking aside, like Mary with serenity rests her heel on the serpent's neck. And I just love all the depictions that I've ever seen of our blessed mother with Satan at her heel the face of Our Lady is just so serene. And, you know, in the sense of combat, I mean, how incredible is the power of Our Blessed Mother just with that sense of like, yeah, I don't have to punch you in the face. I can just keep you right at my heel and just go out about my day. You know, like, I, I just love it. I She's the ultimate mama bear. She really is. Very protective. She is a warrior queen and the queen of the universe and the queen of heaven. Um, but really, of... Our whole human race, Mary is our solitary boast. Mm. You know, her immaculate conception and her fidelity to God's plan, her fiat, you know, it sets her directly in opposition to Satan. And there is nothing more that Satan hates than fidelity to God. And Mary is the embodiment of that and the perfection of that. So that's what we're going to talk about today, why Satan hates the Blessed Virgin so much. Um and I would say, you know, before we get into it, Father Rich, why don't you tell everyone how they could follow us and learn more? Happy to. So if you're enjoying our content and you want to share this content, by all means, go on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We're present on all of those forums at Catholic Talk Show. And if you want to learn more about ways that you can share our content through audio feed as well as visual, just go to www.catholictalkshow.com. There you'll see every way that you could listen in. We're on all the podcasting forums and we're on YouTube. And if you're watching our content on YouTube right now, take a moment, hit the subscribe button, click the bell. Every time we produce a show each and every week, it'll populate on your feed and you won't miss any of the rich content that we offer here at the Catholic Talk Show. Now, we wouldn't be able to do the show without our patrons. If you're considering becoming a financial supporter of our show, go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash Patreon. There you'll see all the cool tiers that we have and some cool gear to send your way by supporting the show and the efforts of evangelization in the digital continent. We live in a very contentious time in the world, and we need to reveal our Catholic faith with great emphasis and zeal and passion. And that's what we try to do week in and week out. And this week's content, really focusing on the Immaculate Heart of Mary, she is the highest honor of our race. She is most blessed among all women. And when we reflect on who the Immaculate One is to us as a mother, what a gift, like Ryan Delacrosse was saying, a mama bear that wants to protect and nurture our relationship with Christ, who truly has conquered sin and death. So as we jump into this content, I think it would be great to take a moment with you and pray a Hail Mary. So let us begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Holy Mary Mother, Mother of God, God pray, for us, pray sinners, for us sinners, now and at the, the hour, hour of our, of our death. death. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So we all know Satan and Mary got beef, right? They are their mortal enemies. And, you know, Where's this beef go back to? I mean, this goes back to the very beginning. This goes to the fall. This goes to the garden. You know, Satan had his first big triumph after his fall in the garden, getting our, our ancestors, Adam and Eve, to fall. And, you know, in the guise of a serpent, using temptation and, and using what Satan himself desires, which is to be like God, as a temptation to humanity, where if you eat this fruit, you'll know the wisdom and you will be like God's. And our ancestors fell, and 
God cursed the snake during it's Genesis 3.15. Because of this, and there's an eternal enmity between woman in particular and the serpent. And in Genesis 3.15, it says, I will put enmities between thee and the woman and thy seed and her seed. She shall crush thy head and thou shalt lie in wait for her heel. Now, Satan in particular achieved his, I guess, crowning achievement through the fall, through the temptation of a woman. And his destruction and his ultimate failure comes through the obedience of a woman. Yes. Which is so perfectly circular and so perfectly fitting and poetic that the new Eve who bore Christ, the Theotokos, you know, Satan had been nipping at the heels of humankind and women for eternity. And ultimately, that woman that fulfills God's obedience crushes his head. And that's just so absolutely stunning and amazing. Um, it's so that's inspiring. Why Satan hates like, her. It's incredible, like, to, to think of the depth of that inspiration, right? And that God would choreograph such a revelation and really kind of close the circle and, you know, to, to realize that this is the proto-evangelium, like this is, this is really like the, the gospel, it's like, it's really like a prophetic voice giving sense at the very beginning of time that the consequences of these actions of the fall are going to be met with an immense victory, and that this victory would come at the heel of Our Lady and fruitfully as a seed from her. And, and what is the, who is that seed? It is Christ. It is the incarnation, God becoming man. And as we sense that enmity that is between the Immaculate One, the one who is without stain, you know, with the Blessed Virgin Mary, the opposition is set out by her identity alone. She does not cooperate with sin. So a Bible that I like to use is the New Jerusalem Bible. It gives great annotations and great like sense of scripture by footnoting as you continue to read. And one of the footnotes for the Proto-Evangelium that Ryan Shield just shared with you from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. So open up the Bible, look at that Proto-Evangelium today, and just kind of realize what does this mean as it plays out in the history of salvation in the person of Jesus Christ, and as we are reflecting so securely and, and intentionally on the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So the, the point that the author and the, and the scriptural commentator is expressing is the Hebrew text, by proclaiming that the offspring of the snake is henceforth at enmity with the woman's descendants opposes the human race to the devil and his seed, his posterity, and hence at ultimate victory. It is the first glimmer of salvation, the proto-evangelium. The Greek version has a masculine pronoun. He, not it, will bruise. Thus ascribing the victory not to the woman's descendants in general, but to one of her sons in particular, and thus providing the basis for the messianic interpretation given by many of the fathers. The Latin version has a feminine pronoun, she will bruise. And since in the messianic interpretation of our text, the Messiah and his mother appear together, the pronoun has been taken to refer to Mary. So in that sense, it's like, you know, we have the new Adam and the new Eve in the person of Jesus Christ and in the Blessed Virgin Mary. And, and these bookends, if you will, the, this kind of full circle that we're describing shows Mary and the importance of her role in the history of salvation as well. And I'm looking forward to really developing that with some accompanying documents. Yeah. So let's look at why, why Mary is so diametrically opposed in in who she is to satan and and i would say probably the most fundamental reason why satan hates humankind but mary in particular and this is very important because satan is about pride that is the that is the king of sins is pride and that is satan's particular and initial sin is because he was god's most perfect creation he was the most beautiful and most powerful of all the angels the first creation of God. 
And in that pride, in that desire to be like God, he fell. Now, in the fall of the garden, he promised the same thing. The same thing that he was aspiring for, he cunningly tricked Adam and Eve into falling for. But here's the secret. Here's why Satan hates Mary so much. Because Mary's his replacement. Mary is now the crowning achievement of creation. Now, our Lord is not a creation. He is, you know, the Alpha and the Omega. So even though he's fully man and fully God, but Mary is only a creation. She has no power of her own. But as a creation, she takes that seat of primacy that was originally Satan's, that was Lucifer's. She is now the most beautiful. She is now the most powerful creation. She is now the one who fulfills God's plan for creation. You know, in her obedience, she counters Satan's rebellion. In her humility, she counters Satan's pride. Everything that Satan was not and caused him to fall, Mary is. And that's why she now has, she's the queen of heaven. She's the queen of the universe. She takes Satan's place because he fell and she didn't. And, she, and Satan and his pride hates that a little Galilean Jewish girl has taken the place of the prideful, mightiest of all creation before her. That's got to drive Satan crazy. And that's why he hates her so much. And that also adds context to what you were talking about, Father Rich, with the proto evangelium um, and, and how uh, there's a reciprocation through Mary and Eve. There's a reciprocation through Adam with Christ. Like this created order had to be reestablished, if you will, to counter this, um, you know, Satan's uh, objection. And that's and that's exactly it. Like you know, to to counter that and this almost like a a recreation. Like you know, like this sense of you know what Saint Thomas Aquinas expressed in the exitus et reditus that God in His exitus, you know, creates all things. And because of the fall, the dependent nature that we have on the redemptive act of God to bring us to that reditus, it's a return to God and and our. Our whole, all of creation is being actively redeemed. And, and that's the, the beauty. And I'm obviously offering this in, in simplistic terms because yeah. Thomas Aquinas goes like super deep into it. And that probably could deserve its own show to really dig even deeper into what that exitus of reditus is. But it exactly points to what you're saying, Delacrosse. Like there's a return that we are cooperating in as followers of Christ. And when we look at how do we cooperate more fully, the Blessed Virgin Mary is it. Yeah. She cooperated. She was uh, she was created, you know. And and you think of the highest honor of our race, the 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 example, the model of all Christians, the help of all Christians, all these different titles that are associated with Our Lady. We understand her in line of Scripture and in the practice of our Christianity as fully cooperating with this redemptive yeah. movement, this ready to. Well, I don't know how you feel out there listening in or viewing. But I, I could speak on behalf of my brothers, Shield and Delacrosse, like we want to participate in that. You know, yeah. I want to participate in that return. And Our Lady is, is a perfect person to be associated with and a company in that process of the return. Yeah, we also um, participate in a more unique way after the fall with God himself. You know, uh, before the fall, we were with God. After the fall, Christ himself dwells within us. We're actively able to unite ourselves to God through baptism in a way that was never given before. And so even, even Christ through not just, you know, the fall and, and, and the counter there, but just personally, the victory that we share with God's mercy and confession, but mostly through baptism and the access that we have to all these sacraments, we actually share in the divine life of God. So God goes a step further to bring us back, to incorporate us into his divine life through baptism. We're literally grafted onto the body of Christ. And I just think, you know, a lot of people get frustrated with evil in the world and, and uh, struggle with their Christianity. But I think framing uh, Christianity through the lens of baptism is, 
it's a very beautiful offering that God gives to us, a free gift that God gives to us to counter all this, you know, and to do so in a way that's way more, I would say, substantial as a, as a, a created, you know, person. Yeah. So like you're mentioning victory, Christ's victory. And, you know, I know all three of us guys like sports movies, right? You know, get Kevin Costner in any sports movie and then whatever. It's great. And in every one of these movies, what's happens is the team you're rooting for, the, the heroes, they're, they're down, right? The scoreboard and they're looking up the scoreboard and they're running out of time and, you know, they're losing and everything's going poorly. And then all of a sudden someone gets a little inspiration and you just hear a little uplifting tinkle of the piano and then the tide starts to turn and everything starts to go that way and then it builds to this crescendo of victory i would say that turning point that little tinkle where you just start to hear the piano playing of the divine plan of victory is in the immaculate conception now so many people get the immaculate conception wrong they think that's yeah. jesus's birth that's the virgin birth it's not the immaculate conception is frankly when mary's parents you know had relations and she was conceived but the particular thing is that she, in a stroke of mercy by God, was conceived without the stain of original sin. Now, Satan had gotten us to fall in the, in the garden, and every person henceforth was born with that guilt of original sin. But Mary didn't have that. Now, you can say, you know, God's changing the rules as he goes, but God could do whatever he wants. And Satan in his pride thought that he was going to win. And Satan's just like, you know. Hey, wait a second. Wait, I, I got these people. They all have original sin. You can't do that. Well, he did. And Mary cooperated in that special outpouring of grace that made her full of grace. She was immaculately conceived, but she also maintained that purity and never sinned. Jesus never sinned. Jesus can't sin. Mary had the fallen capacity to sin, but didn't in her obedience and fidelity because of that grace of the immaculate conception. So to me, that first little precursor that ultimately, um, you know, the victory of Calvary and the resurrection starts right there with Anna and Joachim in that, you know, in their relations as a man and wife that conceived Mary and given that grace to the Immaculate Conception. And, that, and could you imagine, could you imagine the Holy Family, like, the, you know, the Blessed Mother, like the mother of Jesus being at odds with Jesus because of her sinful nature? Like you can never imagine that. Like you can okay, never. How could God be born of something imperfect? Exactly. And and a fool of sin. Mary's yeah. full of grace. There would be know? opposition. Like and and that's not between, uh, you know, the the mother of God and the Proto Evangelium that is very clearly articulated in Genesis. That's not the case between the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Like it's so, just not the case. Yeah, and the Immaculate Conception put Mary beyond the reach of Satan. Mm -hmm. That drove him crazy. He hates her for that. Yeah. It's like, hey, look, I had won. I got this trick, right? I, you know, whatever it is, I cheated and I won. And now every sin, every person is full of sin. And then all of a sudden, wait a second, this woman doesn't have original sin. What are you doing? He, mm -hmm. it drives him crazy. He screams. It's like screw tape letters. He's pulling out his hair and screaming and freaking out. He hates that's a, Mary. That's a great reference. The screw tape letters really shows Satan in the way dynamically that he strikes at the heel that we heard in the in the scriptures in the third chapter of genesis like he it's it's shown and we experience that in our own life don't we like it, we experience the way that the devil strikes at us strikes mm -hmm. at the fabric of our community strikes at the church strikes at our own uh you know journey in holiness and sanctification he's constantly striking and at the heels because that's what he's he was set up at the heels i'm going to give a shout out to my wife she really turned me on into the screw tape letters and that's a book and a play by C.S. Lewis, where it's basically showing a demon going about his task of creating the fall of one particular person. Go check it out. Um, you can't recommend it enough. She, my wife, shout out, Kelly. And Another thing that we have to check out. I'm sorry, Delacross. Well, I was going to say also the, the Great Divorce is um, another terrific oh, yeah. C.S. Lewis book. And that actually shows how we take the bait and we hold on and we don't let go. Yeah. in the face of God. So there's a progression there. I think with the screw tape letters, you can sort of get inside baseball with the, the demons. Um, and then in the great divorce, you see that played out in, in humanity colliding um, with good and, and, and retaining those sins because of some, 
trick that's been played with with another person. You know, if you look at John Milton's Paradise Lost and, and Satan's speech in there, and non serve you, I will not serve, and all that, I think the diametric opposite, and again, Satan hates Mary because she is his opposite. And I think you can find that perfect opposite in the canticle of Mary, in the ode of the Theotokos, in the Magnificat. Now, Father Rich, I know you pray the Magnificat every day. Every day. Every day. Yeah. And uh, better. read that to us, pray that with us, and then explain that a bit. Yeah, you better. So, again, this is the translation from the New Jerusalem Bible, something that I, I love to interact with. Um, because I think the translation is just so rich and a, a perspective that uh, kind of draws, you know, an accent to the N-A-B-R-E, which we're, we're used to, or the N-A-B, the New American Bible. Um, I only use the Dewey Rams, but whatever. <laughs> and uh, Dewey Rams is, is, is obviously uh, something that, that would give you that more literal translation, as, yeah. we, as we all know. Mary said, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. You know, that magnificat you know, that Latin word that means my soul doth magnify the Lord, right? So that's, that would be a, an exact literal translation is, is my soul magnifies the Lord. So when we're considering as we're going through this Magnificat or the Canticle of Mary, this really articulates who Mary is in the mystery of salvation. Yeah, a, a magnifying glass doesn't create its own light. It just increases it or puts into mm -hmm. focus or into a particular focus Mary has no power or light of her own. It's all given in a reflection and a magnification from her soul from the Trinity. Amen. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, because he has looked upon the humiliation of his servant. Yes, from now onwards, all generations will call me blessed. For the Almighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name. And his faithful love extends age after age to those who fear him. He has used the power of his arm. He has routed out the arrogant of heart. He has pulled down princes from their thrones and has raised up the lowly. He has filled the starving with good things, sent the rich away empty, he has come to the help of his servant, Israel, mindful of his faithful love, according to the promise he made to our ancestors of his mercy to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Be the Father and Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I mean, that's amazing. And here's what always hits me with the Magnificat is it's composed as a song. Mary, this is during the visitation. Could you imagine how sweet it would have been to hear Our Lady's voice sing mm. that? Has there ever been a greater song? Could you ever imagine a greater performance than the Mother of Our Lord singing the Magnificat to Elizabeth? Mm -hmm. Magnifying mm -hmm. the Lord. Yeah. And, and something that, that strikes me, too, is, um, and this is why I like to go to different translations, and I highly recommend it, because it gives you a perspective to draw you even closer uh, because at times when, especially for, for priests or people who pray the liturgy, the hours, every, every evening prayer, we pray the Magnificat in, in, that, in that tradition. So that, that translation can kind of become rote in our minds, and we need to renew the mystery of what the Word is expressing to us, and, and it's helpful in this way. So mm -hmm. because he has looked upon the humiliation of his servant, you know, man has been brought low. You think about the fall. You think about our sinfulness. When when you personally sin, don't you feel like that humiliation, that that sense of you know brought low, and we look upon our own identity, you know, as as just worthless, and and as we as we look at ourselves with such disdain and humiliation, what's going to save us from that low state, that poverty? of soul. What, what's going to save us is one who reminds us of our worth and our dignity, that reminds us that we are not an estimate value of our sinfulness. You know, Jesus redeems us, and he establishes us within his family, 
giving us a mother in our Blessed Mother and giving us a father in St. Joseph. And I know for, for each of us, we've had shows on St. Joseph. We've shared so much in conversation and how, how healing that is in our journey. And to be in that nurturing environment of the home of Nazareth with the Blessed Mother and St. Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus, that realigns us to cooperate again. And, and when you look at, because he has looked upon the humiliation of his servant, yes, now every generation will call me blessed. How do, how do faithful Catholics, uh, you know, mm -hmm. call the Blessed Mother blessed? How do we, how do we fulfill that? You know, I, I love when people say, what's the most quoted scripture in the world? John 3.16, you know? Well, no, like actually the most quoted scripture in the world is this scripture right here. You know, because we are calling the Blessed Mother blessed when we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are you among women. And, and, and that nature of her being blessed among all women, being blessed among the human race, it gives us something to look at, and, and we need to look more deeply at it. Yeah, we did that in an episode on the rosary, but really the Hail Mary is just a recitation of Scripture. That's the first half of it is just, it's the angelic salute, it's, it's the annunciation, then it's the visitation, then at the end, there's our supplication to ask Mary to pray for us. I mean, it is an incredibly, I mean, it's just scripture. It's, mm -hmm. and, and the Magnificat, I mean, you know, when you look at it as a hymn, it's the oldest Christian hymn there is. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is the first Christian hymn. Um, yeah. How could there be any hymn before it? Because I mean, this right. was when Jesus, uh, you know, was in Mary's womb. So, I mean, that's foundational, you know, and, and I feel so badly. And if there's any Protestants listening, you know, look, Martin Luther and Leo X and all the problems we've had aside, let's just agree on Mary. Let's let's work from there first and just that Mary is on your side. We can get into the theology of it all later, but just have tenderness in your heart to her first. And a lot of stuff will work out just fine for her. But let's just use that as a starting point because, you know, that's important. And let me be perfectly clear. There is no Mariolatry in Orthodox practice of cat being Catholic. There is no worship of Mary. But when you exactly what she was saying before, she magnifies our worship because she is without sin and can perfectly enter into communion with God in her worship of him and perfectly cooperate. And that's why you show this beautiful relationship between the Blessed Mother and Jesus throughout the entire tradition of the Catholic Church. And, and it's important to see that because once again, don't you want to be that perfect cooperator with grace? Well, yeah, the other thing too is like, you know, you can, there, there's no full like, analysis of this if you're if you're looking at worshiping mary and all this other stuff it's just nonsense uh god himself chose to come as a human being he chose to come to us through a mother in a mother uh cho god chose to be raised by a father and a mother mm -hmm. he um in his active ministry uh saved others human beings, right, that followed him. Uh, we have apostles. We have this whole tradition of Christians that God has inspired to, to create scripture, uh, to compile scripture, to preserve scripture, you know, to, to, to just somehow disconnect Jesus from everything else. Even when you sit in your churches and you're proclaiming the gospel, there are still people there. And those people are a part of it. Yes. You ask them to pray for you. Like, how do you take that and then put a wedge in it and say, well, Mary doesn't matter, right? Like God, God chose himself, chose to, you know, dwell inside of her for nine months before he yeah. came. Yeah. Oftentimes, oh, Ryan, you, I mean, dude, that's so right. And oftentimes it's just people saying, look, well, what do Catholics do? We're different than Catholics. Catholics all about Mary. Let's <laughs> not do that. I don't think there's a lot of forethought into it. I think it's just a standoffish, you know, Absolutely. point of view. Yeah. It's, it's um, very easy to do because because yeah. Protestants will tell you what they don't believe mm -hmm. and then Catholics will tell you what they do believe. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a very big difference. Between, well, it's right there in the name Protestant. They're protesting. And yeah, they're protesting. Look, they're there's right. a lot of there's a lot of Protestants who incredibly exalt Mary and are, are faithful daughters and That's sons right. of Mary. 
Uh, Martin Luther himself couldn't speak more highly of Our Lady. You know, but here's here's the thing, like bringing Mary into your home, Satan hates Mary. And, and Pope Francis, he said something that I really liked. He said, when Mary is in the home, the devil does not enter. If Mary is in your home, the devil doesn't enter. The devil hates Mary. Satan despises the virgin, you know. And if Mary is in your home and she is, you know, serving in her role as the mother in your home, Satan's not going to enter. And, you know, for every Catholic, certainly increase your devotion. For every Protestant, develop a devotion. For every atheist listening, you know, look, if you have problems, Explore. if you're having problems going towards God the Father and Christ, you know, maybe God put Mary there as that softer, gentler first way to initiate yourself and reorient yourself towards the Trinity through a loving, tender mother. Read all the comments in our rosary video. Yeah. I mean, th they're incredible. We, we have a mother that's the same for hundreds of people on that comment string on our YouTube channel. I mean, yeah. it's the same story, right? It's the same uh, spiritual, like, you know, digestion of who she is and how she helps and how she's a, a loving mother. Like you can't like get all these people to just kind of lie the same as like they're robots or something. It mm -hmm. just doesn't work. And for me, you know, living as a practical atheist, you know, living as if I didn't believe in God when I was younger, you know, what drew me back in was the blessed mother. That was like the first thing after reading the scriptures, the first devotion that came into my life was the rosary and it changed, it changed my life and the yeah. seven sorrows of Mary. And, you know, like the guys are saying, we, we have a number of shows on, on this topic. So definitely check those out. If you haven't watched the, the show on the rosary, if you haven't watched some of our other shows on our, on our blessed mother, um, by far, you know, our lady has really shown her hand in the show in in the development of the show. It's, it all comes from her really. And, you know, when, when we look at, the importance of who she is, I, I, we would be remiss if we didn't share uh, a beautiful document, a, a letter, really. It's very short. It's a quick read uh, that St. John Paul II penned back, I believe, in 1996, and it's Mary's enmity towards Satan was absolute. So if you really want a, a document to dig even deeper into like a, a treatment of this from a saint, Definitely check that out. I'm sure she will put it in the show notes. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to access those show notes, go to www.catholictalkshow.com, access this particular show, and you'll see it in those show notes. Now, let's start with this document. Just in an introduction, I'm going to skip a paragraph and then kind of touch on what we're saying through the perspective of St. John Paul II. Mary's faithful cooperation in the saving work of her son made it fitting that she should be completely free from sin and share fully in Christ's grace. In the doctrinal reflection of the Eastern Church, the expression, full of grace, as we saw in the preceding catechesis, has been interpreted since the 6th century as a unique holiness which Mary enjoys throughout her existence. She thus initiates the new creation. And this is what we were talking about before. Along with Luke's account of the Annunciation, tradition and the magisterium, the teaching head of the church, have seen in the so-called Proto-Evangelium, again, Genesis 3.15, a scriptural source for the truth of Mary's immaculate conception on the basis of the ancient Latin version, she will crush your head. This text inspired many depictions of the Immaculata crushing the serpent under her feet, which you see in the bottom right quadrant of, if you're watching YouTube right now, we have the image of Our Lady crushing the serpent under her feet. On an earlier occasion, we recalled that this version does not agree with the Hebrew text, which we talked about before in that commentary, and which is the woman, but her offspring, her descendant, who will bruise the serpent's head. This text then does not attribute the victory over Satan to Mary, but to her son. Nevertheless, since the biblical concept establishes a profound solidarity between the parent and the offspring, the depiction of the Immaculata crushing the serpent, not by her own power, but through the grace of her son, 
is consistent with the original meaning of the passage. Mary was granted power to resist the devil. Amazing. That stuff. last sentence, Mary was granted power. What do we receive at baptism? What do we receive yeah. in communion and Eucharist? What do we receive in the sacrament of confirmation and living it out through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the sevenfold gifts of the Spirit? What do we experience in the devotional life of the church and praying the liturgy of the hours and reading the scriptures and really entering into this mystery? We're receiving power to resist the devil. It's Mary who is that initiator of this new creation that we're participating in. Now, I'm going to go back to the sports analogy and Delacrosse, you being quite the athlete and the baseball player yourself. I mean, when you hit a home run, what happens, right? You, your body doesn't come in contact with the ball. The bat does, right? You're still crushing a home run, but is it the bat doing it or is it you? It's the union. It's the solidarity between the two. It's the motion of the, of the initiator and the bat is the implement. So, you know, splitting a hairs on who's crushing whose head, right? It's the cooperation of the virgin through her son smashing yeah. the head of the Satan, right? Yeah. So, you know, textual things aside, the head of the head crushing of Satan still happens through the cooperation of Mary, even if it's Jesus's blessed feet smashing the Satan's head all flat up like a like pe like a snake pancake, right? <laughs> and when you hit the home run, there's a unity between the person and the bat that sometimes right. you don't even feel the ball come off the bat. That's right. <laughs> it's just natural. <laughs> I've never had the experience, so I'm gonna have to trust you on that, Delacross. Yeah, well, I saw the rich cannot hit a curveball. I, I saw like. the, the longest softball hit in, in uh, <laughs> seminary history right now. <laughs> so you mentioned that, you know, with the Immaculate Conception, Mary is free from sin. But there's something else that's free. And you know what that is? That's the app Hollow, which is the number one Catholic app in the app store. Yes, right? I knew it. Absolutely. That was a perfect segue. And right, there's yeah. a reason why it's the number one Catholic app. It has converted the family of Ryan Delacrosse. Ryan, tell us more about how well, your look, family Just the amount of people he has in his family <laughs> with all those kids. I mean, just that pushes a lot the of envelope. subscriptions. That's a lot of subscriptions. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. So Hollow is a, a great app. I mean, for me, I really appreciate it because it has guided meditations. It also has, you know, the uh, the uh, the Bible in a year with Father Mike Schmitz. It's got. But you are not Father Rich. They just keep Sorry. adding con this app, and it's amazing. It's very beautifully designed, uh, very professionally designed. But I, I think uh, what was blessed me the most is guided meditations, and I think a lot of it comes from just being busy um, with the family in the morning, not having, you know, the discipline to wake up at 5 AM and sit in a chair for 30 minutes and pray. I just kind of wake up and go with it. I, I use this to, to, to draw me into a deeper relationship with God through the daily readings, uh, through guided meditations called Lexio Divina. It is, um, it's a, a ancient tradition, very deeply rooted in scripture. And I tell you, if, if you haven't tried it, it's free. I would try it. It's an amazing tool for prayer and uniting yourself to God. Lots of graces come, have come from it in my family. Hallow really captures culture, the culture of our Catholic faith. And when we open up that word culture, it means cultus, worship. It helps us to worship God. And we have another sponsor, Catholic Monthly, that really helps you to enter into the culture of the church by sending you a monthly box of devotions that really are mind-blowing to help you enter in month by month in the tradition of the Catholic Church so that you can really have the accompanying support to develop worship. Sheil, I think you have one of those boxes right now. I do. I actually, I'm blown away by Catholic Monthly. And you know, like I said, look, they come in a cardboard box, but man, this is a treasure chest because every month Catholic Monthly is sending you a subscription box full of the treasures and the patrimony of the worship and devotion of the church. So, you know, every month there's a month, there's a theme that goes along with it. This box in particular, it's devoted to the sacred heart. So like in this box, I got a sacred heart uh, journal, which is amazing. Nice mother feel. I got a sacred heart chrism candle it smells like the chrism of baptism it's amazing made out of beeswax which you know when those three days of darkness come you can light this and you'll be all right i mean i got a sacred heart uh prayer card a sacred heart um holy metal i got a sacred heart uh, a 
uh, locket back there was that too. That is order. beautiful. This thing's just amazing. Um, but yeah, Catholic Monthly. I mean, it's it's giving you things every month and then a way to use them. It explains what the devotion is, the different prayers you can do. Um, it's it's a way to tap into the treasury of the church, and it's it's fun, it's exciting, and it's you know people who really know the faith curating things so that you can continue to grow. So if you go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash Catholic Monthly, you can get your first month for 50% off now. So go to catholicmonthly.com, well, catholicmonth.ly or catholictalkshow.com forward slash Catholic Monthly. Um, so as we wrap up this episode, there's, there's like a couple, one more thing I want to talk about is how much exorcists talk about the power of the Virgin Mary during exorcism. They say that that's one of their primary tools because Satan hates Mary so much that during an exorcism, invoking her name and making commands in her name against Satan drives him squealing away like a little pig without roast beef. And he calls, we had a we had an interview with a, a guy who did extensive research in um, exorcism, in the field of exorcism. And uh, in, in one of our conversations, it's a beautiful episode, by the way, uh, you should check it out. It's uh, Seven uh, Things Exorcists Want You to Know. And the book was Slaying Dragons. Slaying Dragons. Yeah. And and he said many times um, the that the demon would say the woman, you know, <laughs> like the woman, you know, <laughs> like they wouldn't even use her name. Yeah, um, I'm reading this account by an Italian priest who taught at the Gregorian. His name is Father Babylon. And he said that... Um, she said that Satan says that one won't even call her the woman because being, you know, this proud and mighty fallen demon being, you know, bested by a woman, a poor little, you know, housewife from Galilee. That's who that's who's crushing the head of the mightiest creation of God. I mean, I'm sorry, you can't make this up. You cannot make this up that a poor backwater Hebrew Jewish woman from a nowhere that was occupied by a huge power, born poor, who was, that's who initiates the sequence that takes down Satan? I mean, come on, this is just, it, it is so beautiful and so divinely inspired and perfect. It just, it fills me up, my, my heart, like wants to explode yeah. thinking about how God operates. Touching on that sentiment, Ryan Shield, you know, St. John Paul II concludes with St. Irenaeus presenting Mary in this way. And I think it's, it's just a perfect tie-in as we conclude this show. St. Irenaeus presents Mary as the new Eve, who by her faith and obedience compensated for the disbelief and disobedience of Eve. Such a role in the economy of salvation requires the absence of sin. This is one of the church fathers requires the absence of sin. It was fitting that like Christ, the new Adam, Mary too, the new Eve, did not know sin and was thus capable of cooperating in the redemption. Sin, which washes over humanity like a torrent, isn't that true? Don't you feel that in your own flesh and in your own body? Which washes over humanity like a torrent, halts before the Redeemer, and his faithful collaborator. Who is that faithful collaborator, collaborator that Irenaeus is talking about? It's the Blessed Virgin Mary. With a substantial difference, Christ is all holy by virtue of the grace that in his humanity derives from the divine person. Mary is all holy by virtue of the grace received by the merits of the Savior. And that's how St. John Paul II concludes this incredible letter. So make sure you check out the show notes. Go to www.catholictalkshow.com. Access that letter from St. John Paul II, as well as all the amazing references that we've had along the way. Open up the scripture, pray the rosary, grow in your devotion to Our Lady. And I just want to reemphasize what Sheil said. If you're out there and, and you're agnostic, you struggle with faith, maybe you've been a professed atheist, you know, give it a shot, put it on, like, look into it, you know, don't be apathetic toward it. Like, look into it because this beauty has captured our hearts. We give testimony to that. It has filled our souls. It's filled our hearts. And we want the same thing for you. 
it's transformed the trajectory of my life living so basely and living as a practical atheist. And it continues to amplify and encourage me and inspire me to give more of myself to this divine mystery that we so celebrate in the Immaculate One who has bore our Savior. We want to thank our patrons for your financial support. Without this, we wouldn't be able to do this show. So please continue to consider to become a financial supporter of our show. And we look forward to producing great content just like this and so much more to come. God bless you guys. And we will see you next week. Mm-hmm.